Hi, everyone, and good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. Today is Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021. For those of you that are listening to these in a series, this is our, our, our third chapter. It's actually, I should say, chapter three, I believe. I think I wrote that down wrong. Chapter three, a model for understanding your child. We're going through the journey of the heroic parent chapter by chapter. In between each chapter, we'll spend some time um, talking about and, and addressing questions that you might have in between. So um, the, when we get to this chapter, this chapter really, for me, was the the, the fundamental idea that, that, that came into my awareness as I was becoming a wilderness therapist, a young therapist, I should say, because I really did grow up in the wilderness therapy field um, in understanding what mental health and mental illness is. I talk about this in the Audacity to Be You also, but I love this model, this, this model that I call the cycle of health and wellness, where it kind of diagrams. For those of you that aren't watching, I'll, I'll try to describe that diagram as, as clearly as I can. The chapter starts off from a quote by a gentleman by the name of Kyle Henderson. And Kyle is actually the lead singer and the songwriter for the opening song. If you listen to the podcast, he's the lead singer and songwriter for a band called Desert Noises from Salt Lake City, Utah. And in one of his other songs, I, I heard this song several years ago, and it it really rang to me. I was I was asking Kyle one time. We were on a on a trip from Philadelphia. I'd just seen them play in Philadelphia, and I was working in Los Angeles, excuse me, in um, New York. And so I was driving with Kyle from one place to another, just catching up with him. And as we were driving, I was asking Kyle about writing, about his process. I told him, you know, I was a writer. Sometimes I've in my past, I've written poetry, too shy to share it with people, but asked him what the process was like for him in writing. And Kyle said something simple and, and beautiful. He said, I kind of feel lucky in this process because I just tell the truth. And that hit me squarely. And I realized how beautiful it was as an artist. And I've thought about that in, in terms of artists ever since this idea that Art, in, in essence, is just telling the truth. And the, the amazing thing about art is that, like our dreams, we speak through symbols, right? Images, abstract concepts, uh, and language. But, but in, in a way, like, like Sigmund Freud said, that, that our dreams are the royal road to the unconscious, the most honest thing, honest way that we have of communicating with ourselves, it becomes our job to interpret it. And in one of his songs, one of their songs, I pulled out this lyric for the beginning for the chapter epigraph. And it's a song that Kyle wrote about his growing up in Utah and, and finding that, that, that friction with his family of origin, with his parents and their idea of what he should be and how he should live and his own idea of growing and, and, and up and, and through the messy process of becoming a self. And Kyle wrote this. He said, I could hear my mother say I fall into the world and its filthy way, drowning in a puddle of sin, but my heart's this way. I'm sorry for the mess that I made. If you can open up your ears, you could hear what I have to say. I could pour it, I could leave it on your table for days. We all have this process of when we make a mistake, when we hurt those that we care about because of our choices, we're, we instinctively feel this this shame and this desire to retreat. But beneath that misdeed, beneath that that mistake, beneath that hurt action, there is a, a deep and profound truth that is longing to be heard, longing to be expressed. I had the privilege, in fact, I'm wondering if any of you are the parents of these children. If you are a parent of a child in uh, Dr. Matt Hoig's group, then it could be one of your children. I had a couple of children write me a letter this week. And it was really fun. One of the children wrote me a letter asking for some changes to be made in the program. It was really sweet, giving me feedback on about five aspects of the program. And he's going to be happy to hear. And I wrote him a letter back today that two of those changes are something that we're going to implement right away. I told him in my letter back to him that, that I want to thank him for and on behalf of the students that come much later, that we're always opening, always open to feedback, to mistakes, to, to, to responding to requests or at least considering them. Um, and, and so I wrote back to him and another student in Dr. Matt Hoig's group wrote me a letter um, just asking me what my hobbies were, what my passions were, why we started Evoke, um, just kind of personal questions. 
trying to have a dialogue with me and wrote him back and answered his his question point by point. And I ended both the letters individually. I ended them with the same sentiment, the same essence. I gave each of them one of my favorite quotes. To one of them, I gave the the a quote. Uh, I gave him the poem from K K Khalil Gibran on good and evil. And the other one, I gave him the poem or, or the the prose from Ram Dass on trees. Um, if you want to Google those, you can find those. I've shared them before. It, at any rate, I ended both of the the young men's letter with essentially the same sentiment, which is, I said. I just want you to know that I've made as many mistakes or more than you. In fact, probably more than a, a few of you and your peers combined at this point in my life. And I said, and it's it's been some of the richest lessons in my life. But what I learned uh, several years ago that in those moments where I made some of the biggest mistakes, what I needed wasn't correction or, or judgment or punishment or consequences, but what I really needed was love and compassion and understanding. And so I told both of the boys, you know, I don't know you personally, but I, but I love you and want, want you to know that that whatever you're struggling with, that you're not broken, that nothing's wrong with you, but you're just in the messy process of figuring out who you are. And I, I hope you can do that for yourselves. Um, it is the lesson I've learned as I've grown up. I saw a quote the other day that said, that we don't realize that when we are children, we are watching our, our parents grow up also. But growing up is a messy, imperfect process, and we're going to make mistakes along the way. And I'll talk about how this model, a model for understanding your child, kind of can, can inform us in our process. The first sentence in this chapter says, before rushing to try to change a child's behavior, it is crucial to take time to understand what that behavior might be telling us. This isn't to preclude you from responding with boundaries or consequences, but it is inviting you to also pay attention to what might be beneath or behind the symptom and the behavior. And that with that information, you can proceed from a much more enlightened process. For those of you that are new to this process with me, you'll know as we go along, you'll learn as we go along that, um, our whole approach at Evoke is really a, a, an attempt to first become a, a self, a, 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 a healthy self our, ourself, but also to develop the ears and the eyes to be able to hear your, your children, to hear what they're unable, unwilling to say to us. And I don't dictate specific things for you to do. But in other words, I, I in another way of thinking, I try to evoke a sensibility, a, a way of being where you can hear and see your child, your children better. And that's really, when I was first asked about what the journey of the heroic parent was, it was really an attempt to give parents new eyes and new ears to understand their children in this process. Um, So I have up on the screen for those that you, you are watching and the vast majority of you aren't watching, you'll be listening to this in the weeks and the months to come. I have something called the cycle of health and wellness. I kind of want to tongue, tongue in cheek tell you if you want to see the image, I guess you're going to just have to purchase the book, but I'm going to try to describe it to you as, as clearly and in a linear fashion as I can. The idea is we start off at a point of contentment, right? At a, at a neutral point. And then at some point we experience the experiences of, of life. There are things that we seek after that we're looking for and, and we need. And when we experience those, we experience the emotions that come along with those desired experiences, joy, happiness, love, gratitude, hope, and peace. And then of course there are undesired experiences. Examples I list on this chart are things like divorce, death of a parent, sexual abuse, rejection, criticism, physical abuse. These are the big and the small T traumas. They don't have to be graphic and the worst possible situations. They can be mild or, or moderate on the scale. And then, of course, when we experience these things or we don't experience the desired experiences, we experience the, undesi the undesired emotions, anger, hurt, grief, fear, guilt, hopelessness. Obviously, all of these lists aren't meant to be comprehensive, but just give you give you a sense. 
And then that becomes this, this, this fulcrum, this inflection point where we can go one of two ways. We can learn how to feel or, or move through the emotion and integrate the experience into ourselves, or we can distract ourselves from the undesired emotion, from the hurt, the sadness, the pain, the loneliness, the fear, the anxiety, the depression, the insecurities, the anger. Those undesired experiences are unpleasant. I talk about this in other podcasts that addiction or mental health symptomology defenses are an attempt to not be present in our own lives. I was talking to a, a group of friends recently who are going through a fast for their religious practice. And we were talking about the idea that during the fast, that, that something we take for granted, which is the distraction that, that food can offer us, isn't present during, during a fast. And so you end up being confronted with yourself in a more vivid, powerful, profound way. So when we think about mental health and mental illness and therapy, the substance abuse, the disordered eating, the lying, the sexual promiscuity, suicidality, defiant behaviors, dangerous or risky behavior, self-injury, fighting, electronics addiction, stealing, school refusal, all of those symptoms are there to distract us, to mask the undesired emotion. And this is perhaps one of the most important principles in this cycle. If we, as parents or therapists for that matter, if we pay too much attention to the symptom, the symptom is doing exactly what it was meant to do, which is to distract us and the person that we're thinking about from the authentic suffering. Carl Jung is known for saying that neuroses or mental health issues, neuroses is a substitute for legitimate suffering. In other words, it's a, it's a red herring. It's, it's, it's something to throw us off course. If we talk about weight gain, if we talk about substance abuse, if we talk about cutting, if we talk about school refusal, we're not talking about the wound, the trauma, the feeling. That is why, regardless of the discipline or the practice, a central feature of virtually all therapies is that you send your child to us, to us treatment professionals, or you yourself come to us treatment professionals, and we ask you how you feel. And if we provide a safe enough context and you have the, the courage or the inclination to share your story, we listen. And, and, and you know, th there's a therapist cliche, right? The therapist cliche, among others, is how do you feel? Another way of thinking about that cliche is if we therapists could say, feel your feelings, we would probably say that. But the closest approximation to feel your feelings, we talked about this last night on the Open Forum broadcast. The closest approximation to feel your feelings is how do you feel? Let me listen to you talk about it. And then the individual learns to feel and they move through it. And then in that safe context, they integrate it and it becomes a part of them. They learn the lessons. They learn about themselves. They learn the wisdom that the symptom and what's further beneath the symptom, the unmet need, what that lesson has to offer. Now, we typically look under the, the, the rock. We look for the usual suspects. So in many cases, although you're not the source as a parent of all of your children's pain and trauma, not nearly, that's the first place that we're going to look, among others. We're going to talk about peers, siblings, you know, the classroom, the academic setting. Perhaps there's a learning disability there that caused great anxiety and getting in trouble was a easier thing to experience than being thought of as stupid. For example, there's plenty of research to suggest that that's a very normal course of action. So oversimplified, 
oversimplified. That is essentially what therapy is. And that is essentially what therapy does to, to help you understand your role or how you can be helpful in this process, which is be a safe place. You'll, you'll hear me use the word container. Be a safe container for your child to express and thus feel their emotions. And that's essentially what this chapter asks us to do. For me, this, this, this thing that I just described, this chart, if you're looking at it, that you're looking at, or if you decide to buy the book that you'll look at someday, this chart should be something that should be taught in all schools, from, from elementary school and again in middle and high school. It is something that we can understand about how we human beings function. And we can change from a, a, a paradigm where the goal is to control behavior, to modify behavior, and instead to understand what's going on inside of the individual. It's I saw something today that my daughter shared with me. If you follow me on social media, I shared it on my story. My handle on social media is at Brad Reedy, at Dr. Brad Reedy. And it was from this 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 um, account called Foxes in Love. I think it's a it's a cartoon, and the two characters that the illustrator uses are two foxes, the animals. And it it says in the first pane, the first image, that that many animals are born in the wild with the immediate immediate abilities to survive. Deer can walk and run within hours of being born which is a important part of the survival is the example that the illustrator uses. And then the question in the second image is what are human children, human babies born with? And they're basically born with one coping strategy to cry. In essence, to ask for help. And so the illustrator makes the beautiful but simple point that that is our greatest resource as human beings. We are, especially as children, quite pathetic in terms of our ability to survive and fend off more than any other animal on earth almost. We are the least capable for the longest period of time as a species. So our greatest strength comes from our ability to ask for help. But... What happens for parents because they feel overwhelmed or inadequate? They don't have the bandwidth, the energy, the capacity to deal with the crying child. They frown, they get upset, they get exasperated. And the child learns this. The child learns that something is wrong with them because if they don't think that, if they don't stop needing or suppress their needs, They internalize the parent's frown as something is wrong with me, I am bad, and in essence, I won't survive. I talk about this all the time, and it came up recently with a friend of mine whose brother just had a child. And she described to me, and I've, I've shared this many times, and it happened to me again this week. She said, the new baby is a good baby. It doesn't cry. From birth... We learn and teach that to need is to be bad, especially when that need surpasses the bandwidth and the energy of the parent, the primary caregiver. caregiver. So therapy is a place where you get to express yourself. Last night, the question was asked of me, how do we teach our children how to feel? And the answer is we listen. We ask questions and we listen. And when they don't or can't tell us how we feel, it's really imperative that we get curious about why. We were doing a diversity and inclusion training not too long ago, and the trainer asked all of our employees that were on the call, I think there may have been 50 or 60 employees in one of the two trainings, and she said, how many of you feel unsafe 
to talk about some of these issues, to ask questions. And there was a half a minute of silence, maybe not that long, but it felt like five minutes. And I jumped into the conversation. I said to the trainer, I said, I think you have your answer. I just hosted a, a virtual um, tour today along with our clinical director, my daughter, Emma Reedy, who you all know is our a registration specialist and one of our talented co-presenters and our, our, our program director, Sarah Carroll. We just hosted a meeting today for referring professionals, people that are looking for our services. And, you know, there was, there were some questions. We showed an image, Travis showed an image and he asked everybody, what does this image evoke for you? And there was a lot of silence and a few brave and courageous people. There was no right answer, obviously. A handful of people eventually shared what the image that, that Travis shared brought up for them. And I was thinking, I didn't comment on it, but I was thinking, these are professional people, educated people, people that in essence, uh, I think on the whole, we would assume would be more secure than a young adult or a teenager struggling with mental health issues. And you can feel how difficult it is to put yourself out there from them. So I have this quote, your children deserve the right to feel what they feel. Some of you may not be familiar with the term gaslighting, or you might be. Gaslighting is, is borrowed from a movie, I believe in the early 1940s. It might have been 30s even, with Ingrid Bergman among others. And Ingrid Bergman, the character that she plays, was um, married to a really bad person, a murderer, sociopath, a narcissist. And what he did was he kept turning the, the lights down in the house, the gas lights down in the house, but acting as if it wasn't happening to try to make Ingrid Bergman doubt who she, her own sanity because she was starting to grow suspicious of her husband. And that's where gaslighting was borrowed from. Gaslighting could be severe, like in the movie it's depicted. It's actually a, a decent movie, if you like old movies. Um, but it can be much more subtle than that. And I wrote about this a couple of years ago. I've shared this before, that I wrote on one of my social media posts that most, Karen, most parents, in my experience, gaslight their children. And I got some pushback from, from some readers. But the fact of the matter is, it's true. It's really there's really no good argument against it. Most of us, because of our empathic misery, because of the pain that we experience when those that we care about, especially our children, because of the pain that, that their suffering causes us, we try to talk them out of their feelings. We don't think that. We think we're being helpful. We think we're being kind and loving. And we even tell our children as much. But in essence, we dismiss them. We tell them to look on the bright side, that it's no big deal, that maybe they should think about it differently. And then we tell them all of that is for their best interest and out of love. I write in the chapter, to truly support someone, you must walk the path of difficulty with them. You must hurt with them and acknowledge your powerlessness over their pain. To be present with somebody in their unsolvable problem is perhaps one of the most generous and greatest gifts we can offer as human beings. And it is absolutely excruciating. I talk about this in the book when I was sitting on the broken down fence with Adam and he was describing the loss of his mother and all the pain and grief was, was pouring out of him. I was 30 years old at the time. This was 22 years ago. And I remember realizing I don't have a speech. The only thing I can do is sit with him. And I cried with him. I just made it my goal in that moment to be present with him. To love him in that way. 
I write this, parents may distract themselves from their own pain and discontentment by over-focusing on the needs of their struggling children, child and under-focusing on their own needs. Like I talk about, the, the, the primary building block, if we use the analogy of building a house, the foundation of this house, of the work for us, the foundation is that we have a sense of self, a secure sense of self. And that's not about perfection or an ideal, but it's just to the extent that we've taken care of ourselves, that we've unraveled our own wounding, that we've made sense out of our lives. And it's from that foundation, from that starting point, that we can be present with our children. But it is, it is so tempting, so intoxicating, to distract ourselves and to disown our own discontentment by focusing on our children. And that's why I, I can't emphasize this, this enough or too much. That is why the most important work that we can do is the work on ourselves. That's what our Finding You program is about. It is to take a good, hard look at ourselves to understand our wounding, our messages, our childhood roles, the beliefs, our context, so that we understand what we're bringing to the table, where our limitations are, and that we don't end up doing something for our children that's really taking care of us. There are, it's so often and so common that we're giving to our children something that we didn't get and something that they're not asking for or needing. So we've got to do the work of self to feel where to, to figure out where our holes are, our empty places, our wounds, so that we can distinguish those between between those and what the child needs in the process. I know this is heady and abstract stuff. So to bring it back to the more simple, simple and practical, you go to your 12-step meetings. You go to those meetings that serve people who love people who are suffering from self-sabotaging issues. And you learn to listen. And you learn to be present. And you understand what tempts you, what pulls you out of that presence. I wrote this in this chapter. When we understand that our pain is our love uncovered, and that's borrowed from Khalil Gibran. When we understand that our pain is our love uncovered, that feeling pain means that we are alive. We move away from behaviors that anesthetize us and embrace our pain as part of a life that is whole. It can be instinctual, instinctual and unconscious and compulsive for us to think that the solution, the goal in life is to not feel pain. But what we know from those who avoid pain, we know from writers like Viktor Frankl, who spent time in a concentration camp in Nazi Germany as a prisoner. We learn from people like Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist monk and teacher, from people like Sigmund Freud. You know, we learn that we must be willing to feel our pain so that we can feel everything. We must be willing to go through it. I've told you the story where I had a friend whose young daughter was dying. We knew from her birth, according to the father, that she wouldn't live long. And she actually lived as predicted to the age of 12 years old. And just before she was dying, he was sharing some of his process with his friends, with us on Facebook. Some of the stories and last days leading up to her death. And I was talking to a mutual friend at a professional conference one time about my aversion to looking at the posts and the updates. And my friend, a, a Buddhist himself, said to me, but don't you see that the pain you feel is connected to the love that you have? And the pain that you feel means that you're alive. And being alive is a very temporary thing. 
And when he shifted my, my perspective on pain in psychology or in therapy, we would call it a reframe. But it was really an invitation to transform my thinking around pain. I could lean into it. It was not so unbearable. So we learned to have a different relationship with our pain. We learned to listen, as I wrote, sit, contain, and just be with your children. A therapist taught me some 20 years ago, more than that, actually, probably 30 years ago. I was attending a workshop, not too different than the Finding You workshop 30 years ago. Didn't have any idea what was going on at the time, but it was powerful. And he said, as he set us up in role plays, we, we picked somebody in our life who had hurt us. I ended up picking my grandfather. My grandfather had said some very hurtful things to me growing up. Didn't just pass it down through my mother, but also just presented it to me, first person. And he said, if you want to be the perfect other, the perfect parent or spouse, or in my case, grandparent, imagine yourself with your mouth duct taped shut. If you can't think of what to do, start with shut your mouth and don't say anything. And I was allowed to share my pain about the things my grandfather had done to me, said to me, really, as a child. So when in doubt, the most simple, most practical thing is just listen. And I know that doesn't sound like enough. We, we were taught and it was modeled for us that that was not enough, that there had to be a solution. There had to be a resolution. There had to be a story, an analogy, a practical set of steps out of the pain. And all of those things can come. Often, they are evoked from the person suffering themselves. But at least they come after the person feels safe. The pain is metabolized. In essence, we, we, we talk about really this, this idea is called co-regulation. I did a podcast on it with an expert on this not too long ago. We co-regulate with our children. We show up with them with some version of a healed and whole self. And we sit across from them and they tell us their, their terrible, horrible story about school, about us, about what it means to be a person and a child. And we're able to listen calmly, lovingly. We become larger than them. That's where the idea of the container comes. And we metabolize it. And we reflect back a sense of them by our calmness and our presence that they are okay. They feel safe, safe enough to feel it and to move through it. I wrote this, we act as though avoiding pain will lead to a more joyful life. But I assert that feeling pain shows us that we are alive. Your pain will lead you to where you love. Your pain will lead you to where you love, where you need, and where you feel joy. To eliminate or run away from it, leads to addiction, emptiness, and meaninglessness. We don't cause pain on purpose. We don't cause it for the sake. One of the things that one of the young men, in fact, I see one of the parents, at least, of one of the boys who wrote me a letter this week that I responded to, but, but one of the boys um, wrote to me and said, um, for example, why don't we get a camp pillow? Why don't we have pillows out here? Instead of what we've had them do is take all of their soft clothing and put it into a stuff sack and kind of create their own pillow every night. It's what people that practice primitive living, low impact camping typically do. Um, and he said to me, I assume it's either a budget reason or that you want us to suffer. And I wrote back, I said, it's neither a budget issue nor is it our attempt to make you suffer. That's not what this program is about. It actually is something we've done because the program before us did it. Because the experts in, in 
and minimal camping have told us that that's the way to do it. But we think you're far enough outside of your comfort zone. We're going to go ahead and give you pillows from now on as of today. We haven't done it in 20 years, 22 years. But because this letter this young man wrote, I told him we were going to do it today. But it, we don't cause the suffering on purpose. But it happens. It happens because of life. It happens because you're human. And then when they do hurt, we try and offer them our presence. Unhealthy coping, I write, causes our children to spiral into their symptoms and develop a style that is referred to as a disorder. In family systems theory, we they talk about some of the early family systems theory was just looking at families. They actually had closed circuit TVs. This was, I think, in the 60s, late 60s. They had closed circuit TVs. And in some cases, they actually had an observer sitting in families' homes just watching them and observing them. And it, they developed several ideas out of this observation. And one of the most important ideas that arose out of observing families was it wasn't the thing that caused the problem. It wasn't the, the illness or the job loss, right, or the failure that caused the problem. It was the attempted solution to the problem that became the problem. And they developed this idea of attempted solutions. It is our attempt, our attempts to solve the problems of pain that become the disorder. I used to be a marathon runner and an Ironman triathlete. And I learned from my coaches that if you felt a, a pain, you concentrated on it. You didn't favor it. You focused on the pain. And that if it was an injury, you have to stop anyway. But if you favor pain, you injure yourself. Our attempt to solve the problem of pain becomes the problem. So they developed family systems theory and among other things, one of the things they talked about was helping people change their relationship to the problem, their relationship to pain. Our instinct, I write, to comfort and provide safety for our children while well-meaning can become a barrier to their spiritual and psychological growth if we don't pay close attention. If we just take it instinctively at the surface to protect our children from pain, which is not a bad instinct when they're young, very young. But if that continues and becomes too pervasive and too overshadowing, the child doesn't learn to grow. Everybody listening to this podcast, everybody watching this broadcast, if they're paying attention, can, can identify with that dynamic. Everybody. And I don't have the answer for every single situation, every single choice for you and how to deal with it. But I do know, I do know that it's the right question to ask yourself. Am I trying to prevent them from feeling something that's vital to their, 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 their becoming a person? They're feeling what they need to feel. Can I provide a, 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 a presence for them to offer them comfort in their sadness, their hurt, and their pain? This is one of the most highlighted sections in the journey of the heroic parent, according to Kindle. Pack your lectures and your solutions and your analogies away unless your children specifically ask for them and instead just learn to be present with them. This is what it means to nurture. This is what it means to love and to be a good parent. I have felt no greater joy, intimacy or connection than when I have been on the listening side of such an exchange, both as a parent and as a therapist. I believe that if we can learn to be with our children in this way, then when they struggle and want help, they'll be more likely to approach us for help than to hide their pain away. And perhaps the, the apex of this challenge, I see a couple of you on here from the recent intensive and you'll, you'll recognize this idea from your intensive work this last week. 
The apex of this idea is to sit with them when we have caused them the pain. There is no stronger, more heroic stance than to sit with your child and let them tell you about how you've hurt them without explaining your intentions, without telling them how they are wrong thinking, without reframing it, just sit and listen. You don't have to agree with their objective view of things, but you can deeply listen to their experience of you. You know, during the intensives, I was explaining the intensives to somebody. I may have mentioned this yesterday. I've said this a few times in the last couple of days. Um, during the intensive, we do some role plays. Many role plays. Most of it is role plays. It's called psychodrama. It's what we do. And 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 somebody was asking me yesterday, uh, another therapist colleague of mine was saying, is it about, is the the the, the wisdom in your intensive program about children being able to say things to their parents that they were never able to say, that they've never been able to say. And I said, that's a big part of it, a very, very big part of it. A lot of people feel empowered by that process and healed and healed by that process. And they unload a lot of their pain and their hurt through such a role play. But I said, the real gold in the process of role playing is when we ask the person in the role play who might be talking to, for example, their father or their mother, when we ask them to reverse roles and respond as if, or at least as they think their parents might have responded or might even respond today. And that moment when you, the participant, tell us what you think your mother or father might say to you if you expressed your pain or sadness at what happened in your childhood, especially at their hands, that moment when you speak for them, take your best guess at what they might say, that's when we understand what it was like to be you as a child. And he said to me, do you think people exaggerate? I said, yeah, sometimes people exaggerate stories, for sure. We all do, don't we? But I said, you know what I've learned about exaggerating? We exaggerate when we feel like telling the plain and simple truth won't be enough. We exaggerate when we anticipate that the person we're talking to will try to minimize it. So we make it bigger to emphasize that the pain, the sadness that we feel is real. Your children know your lectures, and the reason that I know that they know them is because they give them to each other. Once they're three or four or five weeks into the program, they are a mini parent. A new client entering into the program, sad at being sent there, feeling like it's a punishment, is not going to be, um, it's not uncommon for them to hear somebody with three, three or four weeks seniority to say, no, you know what? Your parents sent you here because they love you. This isn't a punishment. And we encourage the, the, the one saying that to just be quiet and listen. And let's let the person sort it out themselves. Our identity as parents may even lead us to think that our children are struggling or suffering. Uh, that if our children are struggling or suffering, it means that we are bad mothers and fathers. I've said this before, I said it last night. When a child cries or is in pain or is suffering, it rings a bell in our head to act. It's a, it's a survival response. We know our child is in distress and we need to attend to them. And if we're unable to soothe our child, that same bell that is initially rung says to us, we are inadequate. Something is wrong with me. I am a bad mother or a bad father if I'm not able to soothe my child. And so what do we do? 
instead of confronting and dealing and sorting through that 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 existential angst that we feel that we're not enough or that we're failing or that we're bad we make the child the problem the child is no longer a good baby because it cries too much it is colicky colicky or moody or like i said last night dramatic or a victim or complaining too much or whining or blaming we develop a whole lexicon of, of adjectives to shame the child back into a shape that we can more fully tolerate because of our distress but as we grow up as adults and parents and therapists as we grow up as we don't need our children to reinforce our our, our worth because we're sorting that out ourselves we're more able to sit with our children with our clients with our friends and deeply listen to them and apologize as often as we can not from a place of guilt but from a place of strength compassion and generosity you will know this because the wisest gurus who have walked on planet earth and recorded history have modeled this over and over and over again the ability to offer a genuine apology for having hurt somebody the greatest gift and sometimes the greatest challenge for us is to stay connected to our children when we become overwhelmed frustrated disappointed angry with our children we have lost contact with them it's not a mortal sin it just means that we have some work to do some self-care to do and as you all know as parents sometimes you can't do that can you sometimes you can't step away sometimes you can't go and meditate or take a break or take a walk or watch a movie and so we're up against the limitations of being human what is key is that we can teach and model for our children that it is our limitation that they're experiencing that is our fallibility our our humanness that they're experiencing they have found the edge of our limits another very uh, highlighted oft highlighted passage from the journey of the rogue parent if we learn to tell our stories and if we can be present enough to listen to others tell their own stories then we have arrived at the solution the solution is feeling it talking about it that is why communication skills are so central to the parents curriculum in most every therapeutic program because they provide the family with a healthy outlet for difficult and painful emotions and if we are to create a space for our children to express themselves we must first figure out what prevents us from seeing through the symptoms to the unexpressed emotions underneath the next step is to equip our equip ourselves with the skills that support that process the next chapter the next chapter is on communication skills like i said losing contact with your children it's not an unforgivable or irreparable irreparable act it's just part of your humanity and all of you do it sometimes i said to the group at the intensive this week it's not that i want you to go home with simply more skills and be better i want you to go home and be human be who you are and out of that process you model for your child the most important thing you can model which is being human and from that integrated and whole place along with the skills that you're learning in this process you'll be able to provide them more but you'll take care of yourself more understanding is greater than changing people in fact in maybe the most profound and simple ways understanding is the best way to change other people 
Why are we afraid of compassion and understanding instead? Why do we choose power and control, consequences, and a focus on outcomes? Because we don't have to confront our own demons if we do. We're worried that if we emphasize compassion and understanding instead of power, control, and consequences and outcomes, we're worried that it's going to be utter chaos. We learn that, that fear of consequences, fear of being isolated or abandoned, fear of being slapped on the hand, we learn that those are the only things that keep people in line. But you know from the great stories that you read, you know that the most transformative elements in the human experience is grace and compassion. You know that in stories like Les Miserables, the great story by, by Victor Hugo and the musical based on that story, you know that when the bishop, when they brought Jean Valjean back after he had attacked the bishop physically and stole the silver, all the silver he could find, and when the constables brought, brought Jean Valjean back, and the bishop said, you left the most important part. You left the candlesticks. And then Jean Valjean went on and dedicated his life to loving, eventually taking care of a child. We know the transformative medicine of grace and compassion. There are some cultures that know that too. Ours is not very good at that often. There are some cultures that when somebody is struggling, instead of punishing them, they increase their love and attention. I love the quote that I've been seeing lately that said, instead of thinking of a child's behaviors as attention thinking, attention seeking, think of child's misbehaviors as connection seeking. You're not going to do this perfect. I'm going to end this broadcast in a few minutes. I'm going to rejoin my family and I'm going to screw it up too. But we can learn to, to model apologies, fallibility. We can have the courage to grow up still and learn and to grow and to unlearn the things that we were taught us that aren't serving us or our children well anymore. Like I said, the essence is being who you are and giving your child your presence. It's okay to have boundaries and consequences. It's part of the job. It would be an abdication of responsibility. It would be evidence of a lack of self not to have boundaries and limits and consequences. I'm not talking about abandoning those things. I'm talking about being trauma-informed. You've heard the phrase trauma-informed? This chapter could be called being coming trauma-informed as a parent. You're not going to let your children play with knives or smoke crack in the basement. You're going to have boundaries about yelling and swearing and breaking things and not going to school. But in the back of your head, along with all of that, you're going to learn what it means to be a person and make yourself available to your child in a loving way. I can take maybe one question before we, we, we wrap up and then I can take the rest of them on our Monday night Q&A. Somebody wrote, I needed this tonight. My son is struggling right now and has called me twice to vent and share. I can hear you say, listen, don't try to fix it. I'm better at this, but both times after I offered a, a suggestion, he quickly got off the phone. I still want to rescue. I need these reminders. Thank you. In the words of my therapist from my therapy session today, after I shared something, I was heavy handed with one of my colleagues and I was feeling remorse for it. And she said, tell him. And I thought, how old and how much experience do I have to have before I need to stop you reminding me just to tell him to own it. So thank you. Tell him. 
All right, folks, my books are available on Amazon, The Journey of the Heroic Parent that we're going over now, and The Audacity to Be You, and the audio book is also available in my voice for The Audacity to Be You. We ask all, or if you want to do a deep dive into your work, there may be one spot left in the March intensive. If it fills up, maybe we'll open up another one. The next spot would be April 28th. You can also do an online version for half the time and half the cost, March 24th through 26th, actually less than half the cost, March 24th through 26th. Or if you want to attend a Finding You 2, uh, we have one scheduled for May 12th through 16th. Email intensives at evoketherapy.com. Remember, we have pursuits, adventure trips, anywhere from a few days to 30 days of adventure activities for families and adults. Think Therapy Light. It can also be one of those things you do between programs. We hope by the end of the month to be open back up to parent visits. So more to come on that. That is our goal. That's where we think we're heading as of right now. We have support groups for wilderness families, parents, and alumni. The next one is March 11th at 6.30 p.m. And for intensives alumni, the next online support group, all of these are free, um, is March 9th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Just email malia at evoketherapy.com for more information. We ask all current parents to go to six 12-step support groups. These are free. You can find community and you can listen to others who are farther along the path of learning how to deal with a loved one who is struggling. Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, AdultChildren.org, or RefugeRecovery.org is a program, a support group for people, for Buddhist-inspired program, less of an emphasis on a higher power. And then, of course, NAMI.org, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, has local resources and chapters in your area for free. All of these broadcasts are available on your favorite podcast app. Just search Finding You and Evoke Therapy Podcast or go to SoundCloud.com on your computer. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy. And you can also find at Evoke Therapy Intensives on Instagram. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And of course, the Evoke Therapy blog on our website has new information all the time. My next broadcast will be March 8th. That's Monday, March 8th, next Monday at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. That'll be a live Q&A. Any questions left over from this evening, any that you send to us at webinar at evoketherapy.com, I'm happy to answer. Even if you're a podcast listener, you can send questions, emails to webinar at evoketherapy.com and we'll answer the question on the live Q&A and, of course, any questions that come on from the live audience. So that'll be our next broadcast, 6.30 p.m. Monday evening, March 8th. Thank you for and on behalf of your children for joining me this evening. I hope this is a helpful point of contact. Take care, folks. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.